Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Paley Rothman's COVID-19 Employment Law Q&A. My name is Jim Hammerschmidt. I chair Paley Rothman's Employment Law Group. This morning, two of our veteran employment law attorneys, Scott Mursky and Hayes Edwards, will discuss the myriad local, state, and federal legislative responses to the novel coronavirus that impact our respective workforces, as well as some, as some of the other issues that we face as we decide how to manage our workforces in these unprecedented times. Um, we understand that everyone is faced with making tough decisions about cutting back hours, working in shifts, teleworking furloughs, partial or wholesale layoffs, or providing paid or unpaid leave. The new Families First Coronavirus Response Act may impact those decisions, as does the more familiar laws that we deal with on a daily basis, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act, the regular Family Medical Leave Act, Title VII, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, and local sick and safe leave laws. Not only that, but our employees are asking questions about unemployment health care. Obviously, they're very concerned about their future and well-being. On top of all that, um, based on this morning's news, it appears that Congress is on the verge of passing the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, known as CARES Act which may include tremendous incentives to try to keep our employees on the payroll. These are very complicated and difficult matters. Things are happening at lightning speed. Our goal this morning is to try to provide you with some guidance and answers to these difficult questions. Before we get started, um, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping matters. As you all know, you're uh, automatically muted, so we can't hear you. But if you have questions, please use the chat box on your toolbar. And please, if at all possible, wait until the end of the seminar to submit them. We will try to take as many questions as we can at that time. The slides and material are available to download in the handout section of the toolbar, but they will be made available after, uh, along with the recording, if you have trouble accessing them. Finally, of course, please be patient. Uh, if there are any logistical or technical issues, since we are all now working remotely and uh, trying to do our best, uh, dealing with new technological issues of the uh, remote workforce. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Um, Scott and Hayes, uh, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Scott Mursky. Um, happy to have you all on board, and we're going we're gonna to dive in um, to our first set of slides and uh, discussing the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act. But before that, I, I did want to echo what uh, Jim said. This is obviously a difficult time for both employers and employees and business owners. Um, and as we go through the law, I, you know, there's always competing issues. Um, you have to continue to focus on, you know, your relationships with your employees, employee morale, PR issues, marketing, your common sense. You can't throw that out um, in, in these difficult times. Um, it's a fluid situation, so things are constantly changing. So we need to be careful um, and understand that the information we're providing is what we have currently up to date. So I wanted to first talk about the uh, Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that act provides leave benefits in two new ways that we're not used to. Um, the first is called, is under the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, and we're referring to that as EFMLEA, and then there's also a new federal paid sick leave law. So just quickly to address these two, um, these new laws are covering employers with 500 or fewer employees. Um, and in order to get leave under the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, an employee must be employed for 30 days to be eligible. And this leave is covering only uh, individuals who have lost childcare due to school or childcare closures and need leave associated with such. And under this new law, um, employees are entitled to 12 weeks of leave. The first 10 days um, will consist of unpaid leave, and that would be subject to any other leave benefits that the employee may elect to use. Um, that could be their paid time off or other leave that's now going to be federally 
available. If we could advance the slide, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, one more, please. Great. So, um, and again, this is where I was um, addressing those issues. So, this leave after the first uh, 10 days becomes um, paid leave. And under the current act, and again, we're talking about uh, individuals who have childcare uh, issues, will now be able to receive, and this is an, a, an employer paid benefit, up to two thirds of their regular pay. Now, this is capped at 200 per day per employee and $10,000. Uh, aggregate per employee. So this is a benefit that is new under the uh, Family Medical Leave Act, which which is uh, the law that has been on the books for a while, um, but most smaller employers have not had to deal with it because it typically only covers um, employers that have 50 or more employees. But the amendment to this act, and that's what we're discussing now, covers smaller employers uh, even if you have less than 50. So, and it, this is a new paid benefit under that act because traditionally the FMLA only covers unpaid leave. So um, now not only are smaller employers not used to dealing with the FMLA, they, have a, they now do have to comply with this portion of the FMLA and the paid benefit if an employee is out due to the need of school or um, lack of school or child care closures. And again, that would be for up to 12 weeks at two thirds of the regular rate, uh, and then subject to the caps that are in the slide. If we move to the next slide, there is some relief for employers with fewer than 50 employees. You can apply for an exemption to the Department of Labor. Unfortunately, we don't know um, how that process is exactly going to work. Uh, the regulations for this act have not been established yet by the Department of Labor. They are working on them, but obviously everyone is uh, is this fluid for the Department of Labor, and they have to get their regulations. But the standard that the law sets up is that the employer is going to have to establish that it jeopardizes the employer's viability of the business as a going concern. So you're going to have to basically say that if you had to pay this amount, it would impact your business probably to the point where you would no longer be in business. Um, the other uh, relief or, or uh, I guess protection for small employers is that if you do have fewer than 25 employees, you're also allowed to um, have the, re it's the reinstatement provisions of the FMLA are relaxed. Ordinarily, if someone takes FMLA leave, you are required to hold their job open and return them to the same or similar position. However, um, if you have fewer than 25 employees and if the position no longer exists due to the economic conditions or operational changes um, due to this, the COVID emergency, then uh, you, you may not need to restore that employee back to their job after the 12 week period comes to an end. So that is the first uh, amendment or new law that, that employers need to be uh, careful of. The second amendment dealing with paid leave or, or new law, I should say, is called the new federal paid sick leave law, which is on the next slide. And again, um, this would cover employers with 500 or fewer employees. And what makes this, this one a little bit unique or different from the previous benefit is this covers an employee from their first day of hire. And the earlier leave that we were discussing, an employee needs to be employed for at least 30 days um, in order to, to be entitled to that leave. But this one covers everyone from the day that they're hired. Uh, and it gives you essentially 80 hours or gives the employee 80 hours of paid sick leave. And I should also point out, uh, if you're missed, that this statute is not going into effect until um, April um, 2nd of this year. So none of these provisions are you're required to be doing at the moment. And um, that's good because like I said, we don't have the regulations and hopefully by April 2nd, we'll have additional information and we'll be able to provide further guidance on how to handle some of the more difficult questions. But um, so come April 2nd, 
uh, if employees fit into one of the six categories listed on the slide on slide six, you would be required to provide paid leave. Um, and the essentially um, numbers one through th three and number six deal with situations where um, something is directly affecting the individual employee. Either they've been subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order. They've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. Um, they're experiencing COVID-19 sy symptoms. Um, and then number six is sort of a catch-all if they have any, if you are suffering from something probably that would be similar to COVID-19. So, though, and that they are um, one of the groupings that would uh, require an employer to provide sick um, lead, paid sick leave. And then numbers four and five deal with the situation when your employee has to care for someone who is um, subject to a quarantine or uh, isolation or is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. And number five deals with the situation where, again, like the earlier benefit we were talking about, that you're caring for a child whose school or place of business is closed. Related for reasons related to COVID-19. So under if if you have an employee come um, April 2nd that fits into this category, you are required to provide them up to 80 hours of paid leave, and it is prorated if um, if it's a part-time employee. Now there are some caps that are also available for this statute as well. So if we can move to the next slide, and, and we're going to have to toggle a little bit back and forth between slide six and seven. We discuss or we list for you what, what the caps are. And essentially, if the employee, him or herself, is, is suffering from this uh, disease or has been advised to stay home, then the, their cap would be $511 per day. Hi, sorry, for, Scott. I'm just going to interrupt yes. real quick. Um, I'm getting a couple of messages that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty for some people. Um, and we have been advised by our IT department to um, stop the webinar real quick um, and then reboot and start it over again, if that's all right with everybody. Just we want to make sure that everybody can hear. Here. Sure, sure. Just, just as a brief recap, and I'm not going to go over from everything in the beginning because you'll, you will get all our slides, but essentially, uh, under the families, Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, beginning April 2nd, there's two new leave benefits. Um, the first one is the Emergency Family, Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, and the second one is the new federal paid sick leave law. And I, we already went through the, the first one, uh, which essentially, briefly, in a nutshell, covers um, employees who need to take time off for childcare, um, reasons for their children's school is closed, it's uh, the two week, first two weeks can essentially be unpaid subject to other laws. And after that, they get 12 weeks of paid leave at two thirds their salary and it's subject to caps um, that are in the slides. So just to where we are uh, conceptually in the presentation, we're talking about the second uh, um, prong or the second change that was made for employers. Um, and that's the new federal paid sick leave law which has six categories of when an individual is uh, eligible for up to 80 hours of paid sick leave. Those six categories are in slide six. Um, I'm not gonna read them because we already went through them, but essentially um, those, are the, those are the buckets that someone would fit into that, that you would require an employer to give them 80 hours. But there are caps um, like, like the other um, statute amendment. So on page seven, um, where the caps are, Essentially, if you're if you need the leave due to numbers one, two, three, and six on the previous slide, it's five hundred and eleven dollars per day uh, per employee, up to fifty one hundred and ten dollars per uh, employee aggregate. And then for numbers four and five, which are essentially if you need to take if an employee needs to take the leave because they need to care for someone who has COVID nineteen and or because of lack of childcare, the caps would be two hundred dollars per day um, and up to uh, $2,000 per employee. Again, there's that same exemption that we talked about under the other act, which is that you can apply to the DOL for an exemption. Uh, we don't know the exact way that that's going to be handled. The regulations are still being drafted, but essentially it would be the employer's burden to prove 
that paying this amount of money would jeopardize the um, viability of the business uh, as a going concern. And essentially, we sort of interpret that to mean that it would essentially put you out of business if you had to comply with the um, new requirements. Um, you can still require your employee to comply with notice provisions and letting you know that they need to uh, to take the um, the time off. There's also going to be notice requirements that you inform your employees uh, regarding the the new laws. There's a form that the DOL is working on that's going to have to probably be electronically given to your employees or, or posted if that's even practical at this uh, standpoint. But again, we don't have those. Hopefully, they will be available um, by uh, April 2nd when the new law comes into effect. Um, there are some on slide eight. We just wanted to note that there were some exclusions um, to these laws, especially for healthcare providers and emergency responders. And we also wanted to emphasize that none of these two laws would uh, cover an employee who simply refuses to come to work for fear of exposure or is refusing to telework because of fear of exposure. And it would not cover uh, uh, individuals, this new law would not cover individuals who are not essentially exposed, sick, or caring for a family member or caring for a child. And finally, it would not cover uh, employees who lost their jobs before April 2nd, during which is the effective date of the act as it currently stands. Now, you may be asking yourself, uh, I can't afford this, and what am I going to do? So the upshot for the employers are on page nine. There's tax credits that are going to uh, be available for the same individuals or same companies that are um, required to comply with this. So again, it's for employers with fewer than 500 uh, employees. And essentially, you will get a dollar for dollar credit um, up to the caps that we previously discussed if you have to pay wages subject to um, someone falling into one of these buckets of eligibility. So that is good news. Um, and the other good news is that you can start taking that credit in your next quarterly uh, payroll uh, payment. So again, and we're still waiting for the specific guidance, but if, we, if you turn to the next slide 10, we have some general information saying that you will be able to withhold uh, in your 941 filing from your federal income taxes that you owe or the employee, employer, or the employer's share of the Social Security and Medicare taxes. So in other words, um, it, it, on slide 11, we kind of give you a walkthrough process of how you can determine what your uh, credit would be. And essentially, you would want to calculate your payroll tax liability for the next quarter. And again, you may need to estimate some of these. Um, calculate how much you're going to be paying of the qualified sick leave wages. And again, you would only be able to take the tax credit for individual, for, for this tax credit, you would only be able to, to use it for individuals that you're paying salaries for under one of the two acts that we earlier discussed. And it, but again, it would be a dollar to dollar amount. And then you would be able to um, deduct that from your quarterly payment. So this would be an immediate relief. In other words, as an example, if you owed 5000 in your quarterly payment and you had paid $1,000 worth of wages to workers who um, fit under this new act, then you would only pay 4000 So you would have an immediate relief. You don't need to wait until next year to get the credit. And likewise, if you are in a situation where you actually would uh, be owed money by the government, if you did this calculation, you'd be able to apply uh, for a refund and or credit against future quarterly payments. So that's the upshot for employers um, in, under this, this new act. So I, that's the um, basic, um, that's the summary, quick summary of the employment related uh, issues or not issues, but the requirements under the new Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act. There's a lot of other provisions dealing with 
unemployment and, and things of that nature, but that's, these are the leave provisions that we wanted to highlight for you. Because the next act, which is still going through Congress now, and that uh, begins on slide 12, is the CARES Act that Jim referred to um, earlier in the call, which is still pending in Congress. Um, Senate, the Senate passed a version yesterday, late last night. It's about 800 pages, so we're, we are still taking our time to go through it. But I did want to point out some of the highlights. And again, this is not law. What we discussed previously is the current law come April 2nd, subject to the regulations that need to need to come out. And also subject to if the CARES Act is passed, there may be some slight modifications to certain provisions. So the CARES Act is kind of like a supplement or an additional um, stimulus package. And it, but as it, and it deals with a lot of things, but for the context of employees, the two, the two big, or for employers, I'm sorry, the, the two big things are um, loan forgiveness is what I discussed in number one, where you may be able to, you would be able to apply for a loan if you have fewer than 500 employees to assist you with payroll costs and mortgage payments. And, um, there may, and there actually would be loan forgiveness for, for certain payroll costs and mortgage payments and rent as well. However, there are going to be requirements that you are keeping your employees paid and you're, to the extent that you can, operations are still being moved forward. Um, so there is a provision in this new law, or I'm sorry, in this act, which is making its way through Congress, that if you have to, if you've laid off employees, you can still rehire them under certain circumstances bring them back on and be in compliance um, to get these um, these forgiveness loans for certain payroll costs and uh, mortgage payment and rent payments. The other big benefit under this new, act, this new bill is that if it's passed in its current form, there would be an expansion of unemployment benefits. Essentially, workers would be entitled to a $600 additional per week, and that would be on top of what they already would be eligible for under the standard unemployment calculations. And, um, and that would be for up to four months. So you originally, many, many employers were contemplating uh, furlough, fur, doing a furlough or laying off workers. Um, but now that we see that there's going to be some relief associated with furloughed, I'm sorry, with employers that keep their employees um, paid, you may want to reconsider that and do the economics and consider even rehiring workers that, that you have let go um, so you can take advantage of some of these um, loan forgiveness plans that are in, in the CARES Act. But again, the CARES Act has not been passed, uh, but I do hear that it's going to the House tomorrow morning, and some people on the Hill are very optimistic that it is going to be passed. But that is um, to be continued. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties, and I will pass the presentation over to Hayes. Thanks, Scott. I'm Hayes Edwards, and I see that we've already received a lot of questions, um, some directly about what Scott said, but we're going to wait until the end of our slide presentation to address those questions, um, which should probably be another uh, 20 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about state legislation. Um, a lot of this practically is redundant of what the federal government has already done, um, and it covers the areas of unemployment insurance and the so first piece of legislation I want to address is the Maryland COVID-19 Public Health Emergency Protection Act of 2020. Um, right now it's only effective through the end of next month, or I'm sorry, it's effective through, through next year. And it prohibits employers from terminating an employee solely on the basis that the employee is isolated or quarantined or needs to care for a family member affected by COVID-19 or has left work due to the risk of infection. So essentially the state is seeking to prevent employers from just terminating employees and keeping them on even if they're not able to work. And the second part of this bill fits hand in hand with that. And that part provides those workers who are not able to work, but of course can't be terminated, to apply for and receive unemployment benefits. And we'll talk about those unemployment benefits more in a couple of slides. So let's move on to number 14, please. 
Next piece of legislation to address is DC's COVID-19 Emergency Act. And this was passed in, it was passed last week and it's effective through May 15th, 2020. It can be extended 90 days. And essentially the protections that it provides coincide with the mayor having declared a state of emergency in DC. And the unemployment benefit part of it will be addressed in a later slide, but right now I'll talk about the DC FMLA, which is a DC statute. It has the same name as the federal statute, but we call it the DC FMLA. And here it provides unpaid leave under a new subcategory of leave called the Declaration of Emergency Leave, which is self-explanatory. And, and this leave is incredibly broad. The requirement for employee size of an employer is gone, and the requirement that an employee has worked at least a thousand hours in the last 12 months is also gone. So anybody who is missing work because of the COVID-19 epidemic um, can probably apply for this. There's no need to provide any medical certification because the Declaration of Emergency already provides that as a blanket qualification for anybody. And you'll notice that the quoted language in the third bullet point is, as I said, very broad. And it appears, at least at this point, without further guidance, that that might apply to things as broad as, as people who simply can't get to work because of the, the pandemic and its results, in addition to people that are sick or caring for somebody else who is home and can't care for themselves. But let's move on to the next slide, please. So now we'll get into the unemployment provisions that have been changed and added by local jurisdictions. So the contents of this slide have already been addressed, but I'll go through it again that Maryland has changed its law to say that an individual can get unemployment even if they haven't been terminated but if they're not working for one of these three COVID-19 related situations. Um, the, the Department of Labor also put out guidance saying that even if your hours have been reduced, you can get partial unemployment benefit. Now the third point here is different from DC and Virginia. And that is that Maryland employees seeking unemployment still must file weekly certificates that they are seeking out new work, as was the default under the um, pre-existing unemployment regime. Go on to the next slide. You'll see the provisions of the DC Emergency Act that regard unemployment insurance. And this unemployment insurance is specifically available for those who have a date certain of returning back to work. So people who know they're not technically unemployed for a long period of time um, are eligible. And even if, you know, whether or not there is a certainty of coming back to work, they're eligible. That's the bottom line. Um, DC does not require that they file weekly certificates. And the employers can also rest easy because this expanded unemployment insurance will not count against their experience rating. So if we go on to the next slide, we have the results of Governor Northam's emergency measures in Virginia. And these are largely overlapping with what Maryland and DC have done, but Virginia has erased the one week waiting period for benefits, which means people can get the benefits as soon as their application is processed. And that those workers are eligible to receive benefits if the employer slows or ceases operations, or if they're not able to report to work because they're either sick, quarantined, or if they're caring for another family member who fits into one of those categories. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll begin our question and answer portion. And these are questions that um, we have collected we've received from clients and we've seen being tossed around and we think would be generally helpful for everybody. So I'm going to pass the floor back back to Scott right now. 
Thanks, Hayes. I also wanted to uh, emphasize also in the proposed CARE Act that's going through the Congress right now, while it's not directly related to an employment issue, is that it is being uh, proposed or it's in the legislation, individuals would receive um, a $1,200 check in the mail, essentially, if they make less than $100,000 a year. So while that's not directly related to the employee-employer situation, that is another um, benefit that may be coming to some of your employees that are that are that are struggling, and I believe it would also apply to any independent contractors that that you will, that that you have or that you were associated with may be eligible to apply for this relief as well. So turning to the question and answers, and and I think it's important to take a step back for a quick second before we dive into them. That what Hayes and I have been discussing, as Jim pointed out, were, are only the new changes that have, to the law that have come into effect in the last two weeks. And where the complication comes in or where the difficulty comes in is applying those the new laws to the existing laws. And on top of that, you also need to take a look at your own policies and procedures as far as leave, um, what you may have obligated yourself to do or your company may have obligated themselves to do under employment agreements or employee handbook. So you, you do need to start there and you kind of need to start at the baseline and then and look at your agreements, look at your handbook, and also look at existing laws. And you, in order to do so, you, those laws may not just be federal laws, but there's also many states and counties that have mandatory uh, paid sick leave laws that, have, that are gonna be in effect now given the current circumstance. So the first uh, couple questions uh, on slide 19 um, and 20, Deal with uh, how do how does the new federal law interact with the Montgomery County Earned Sick and Safe Leave law? As you may know, under the Montgomery County Earned Sick Sick and Safe Leave law, you are employers are required to provide leave under certain circumstances that are very similar to the leave that's under the federal the new federal law. Um, from the guidance or the interpretations that we have read, have read and believe that th these benefits. Are, have to be paid in addition to any of the federal, the new federal benefits. So an employee who you have that's working in Montgomery County would be eligible for leave under both laws. And under the Montgomery County law, we wanted to point out that if your business is closed or not operating at the current situation due to the public health emergency, you would need to pay them their uh, sick and safe leave to the extent that they have earned it. And, and typically they earn it at a rate of one hour for every 30 hours worked, up to 56 hours a year. It's a little bit less if you have less than five employees. So you need to figure out if your employees have earned sick and safe leave if you're in Montgomery County. And if you close, you also have an obligation to pay that amount. Um, so we have a best practice tip that if you're closing, you have to be aware of those hours that are available and it, and it could result on you having to pay both the, well, will result if they fit into the buckets that require you to pay into both paying the Montgomery County Sick and Safe Leave Law and the Montgomery County Sick and Safe Leave Law. And we've also had the same question in, in slide 20, um, how does the new law interact with the Maryland Healthy Working, Family, Working Families Act, which is the Maryland law that deals with paid leave. It's not quite as broad as, uh, the, it doesn't cover quite as many things as the federal and the, and the Montgomery County law does, but it does, it is available for sickness, maternity leave, and domestic abuse situations. However, it does not cover uh, loss of, of not being able to work due to loss of childcare or school closures. However, um, it's, and it's also not available for the closure of an employer's business. So if you're in, in Maryland and you're not in Montgomery County, um, you, you need to focus on the Maryland Healthy Working Families Act. And, and that act, is, is if the person is eligible, is fully paid at one hour for every 30 hours work up to a maximum of 40 hours per year. Um, and that's typically how that, that is accrued. So you need, to, you need to check with your state. If you're, if whatever state you're in, to see if you have a state law that deals with mandatory pay leave, as well as 
um, your, the various counties as well. And Hayes, I'll turn it over to you for slide uh, 21. Thanks, Scott. So this slide addresses the interplay between the new federal act and DC's declaration of emergency leave. And you probably remember from a few slides ago that DOE leave is very broad. It's available to all employees, lasts for the duration of the public emergency. Um, and of course the recent bill will expire in 90 days. It is subject to extension. Um, don't forget DOE leave unlike a lot of the leave we're talking about today, is unpaid. And our, our best practice tip for employers who are seeking to comply with, with both of these regimes, um, if you do remain open, you'll need to pay your eligible employees during the 10 weeks of EFMLEA leave or 80 hours under the paid sick leave law. But after those periods, DOE leave is going to give them unpaid leave for the duration of the public health emergency. But of course, during that DOE period, or DOE only period, I should say, the unpaid period, the employees have the option of using PTO um, pursuant to the empl your employee policy or employee handbook, of course, um, just like PTO can be used to supplement any of the, the two thirds paid leave portions. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So Scott addressed this earlier, but the FFCRA provides the ability for businesses with fewer than 50 employees to seek an exemption under the FFCRA. And the language they use is good cause, which lawyers like to call a, a, a weasel word. It, it's a, a phrase that can mean a lot of different things. It's the phrase that can begin a lot of different arguments and, and give the employer and the employee uh, a But hopefully DOL is going to provide some criteria on what constitutes good cause. Um, the way we read the legislation is that there's a pretty high standard for employers here and that it probably needs to pose some sort of an existential threat or a threat of um, preventing the company from making it through the current crisis or, or bringing about the likelihood of the company going under if it needs to comply with all of these laws. But um, hopefully DOL gives us a more concrete phraseology here than good cause, although can't guarantee that. So let's go on to the next one. This slide addresses whether employers can require their workers to use PTO during the FFCRA coverage. And you know, whenever you talk about leave, you have to think about the way different types of leave overlap or whether they need to be strung end to end or how they supplement each other. And the new federal legislation makes clear that those first two weeks are guaranteed, although they're unpaid under the expanded FMLA leave, um, the employer can't require the employee to use leave, use PTO during those weeks. Um, if the employee is also sick or self-isolating, then they qualify for the paid sick leave and they get paid at 100% during that time. So the best practice tip here is that if employees are missing work due to solely child care issues, they can use the unpaid first two weeks or they can use the 80 hours of BSLL during the first two weeks at two-thirds pay. That's the more likely route. Um, and of course, that two-thirds pay or the two weeks of unpaid FMLA leave can be supplemented by PTO pursuant with the employer's policy. So let's go on to the next slide. Now, we've known about this April 2nd um, date for some time, ever since the FFCRA was passed. And I think a lot of employers are trying to implement a plan around that date. But another thing that we've seen is that employers are taking things two weeks at a time. And there's a potential that a two week plan might overlap April 2nd, or some employers might not have realized that that date is going to change their obligations. So if your business is completely closed, 
we read the bill as leaving open eligibility for FFCRA benefits for employees. However, if you're open, meaning some business is being done, somebody's doing some work, but certain employees are specifically furloughed as of that date, then those employees are not eligible for leave because there is work being done generally, but none is being assigned to them. So you need to be careful with any sort of a two-week plan, and generally you need to be uh, proactive in what your obligations might become to different workers as of April 2nd, and make sure that you've been clear on whether you are completely closed or whether certain workers are furloughed. So let's go on to the next slide, which Scott is going to address. Yes, thanks, thanks, Hayes. Um, and I would just add that hopefully when we get regulations, some of these questions will, some of these answers will become much clearer. But I did want to talk uh, briefly about telework. We're getting a lot of questions about what are the legal risks or concerns associated with allowing workers to telework. And um, this is something where some employers do have telework policies, some don't. But I would suggest that if you don't have a telework policy, that you at least are providing your employees with some general guidance regarding whether or how they are to be handling the telework and what their obligations are, and that they have the same duties and responsibilities that they would have if they were in the office subject to you know the limitations that they face but some of the major areas are that you have to have a system at least for your employees who are paid hourly how are you going to be handling their time reporting for the non-exempt employees so you need to make sure that you have a way that you're keeping track or that they're keeping track and then reporting it back to you because that will flow into the second one uh the overtime obligations if an employee ends up working, the non-exempt employee ends up working over 40 hours in a week, the employer is going to be responsible for overtime. So you do want to make it clear that they are still supposed to be working the same hours that they typically work, if, if that's what your or your plan is. I mean, you can certainly uh, have them work less hours, but if you are going to be requiring them to work, you want to make sure that they're not going over 40 and then... Uh, you know, of course, you would have to, if they do go over 40, you would have to pay them a time and a half. So it's very, very important that you get your, your uh, time and reporting down and how, how you're going to be managing that. The other major concerns is typically um, safety issues. And a lot of times these would be addressed in a um, teleworking policy. I'm sorry, a teleworking agreement. At this point, we're not suggesting everyone have their employees sign telework agreements because it would just be extremely cumbersome under the circumstances. But just so you know, um, if an employee who's working for you at home, um, you would be responsible if they, not you, but your workers' comp would, would, would have to cover them um, if they are injured at while they are working at their house. So if the employees do get injured while they're working, you do want them to report that to you and to handle it just like you would handle a claim if they were injured while they were working for you in your office or place of business. And then the final thing, it's not really legal, but it's IT security. Um, you want to remind employees that, that, you know, just like if they were in the office, not to be clicking on links, not to be, uh, to be, to be cognizant that there could be uh, accelerated uh, hackers and, and phishing expeditions going on in the internet and, and people may be a little uh, more vulnerable to to clicking on things that they shouldn't, and so I think it's important to remind your employees of the same IT security protocols that they would have to follow if they were in in the office. So Hayes, I'll turn it back to you for slide 26. Thank you. So this is maybe one of the most common questions. Um, people might have tackled it by now, but I think it's definitely worth addressing, and that's whether an employer can reduce the salaries of exempt workers. Um, as you probably know, salary is defined as a guaranteed payment regardless of the amount of hours worked during a given week as long as there is some work done. So generally the answer is yes. Um, but we'd recommend that if you're going to change the salaries for exempt workers that you follow two big rules. One is to make a single one-time cut and the second is to try to treat all employees the same. And the reason you should make the cut only once is that if you make 
more than one or you know five or six, then you really start to make it look like there is no guaranteed payment. It, it looks a lot less like a guaranteed payment has been reduced in amount, and now there's a new guaranteed payment, and it starts to look like the employer is essentially backing out of the salary arrangement that it is required to comply with. The reason that you shouldn't make different percentage cuts among different employees is that you open yourself up to a potential claim or you could create the appearance of discrimination um, even if all the employees in one category happen to be of a single gender and all the employees in a different category happen to be of the other gender then you run the risk of appearing to be making the decision based on gender and not based on the type of work being done now maryland always prefers two-week notice, but so much of what we're talking about today is brought about by and appreciative of the exigent circumstances. So although you might not be able to give two weeks, we really recommend that all, all or any and all cuts be put in writing, that the employees be given as much notice as possible, and that a written acknowledgement is requested from the employees. Although it's important to understand that if you're making cuts in the right way, the employee doesn't need to sign anything. They don't need to agree to it, but that, that modification will be enforceable if it's done correctly. Please. Let's talk about non-exempt employees and closures. So just like any other time, the employer can reduce or eliminate hours of shifts as it sees fit. Um, again, you want to be wary, wary of any discriminatory appearance. Um, but and this is another question that came up a lot in the first couple of days of, of closures and people working from home. And that is that when a non-exempt workers hours are reduced or eliminated, they become eligible for unemployment insurance. And that was a, um, a triggering criteria of all three local jurisdictional unemployment insurance regimes that we looked at earlier. So again, the rule here really is just to be wary of non-uniform reduction to eliminations. Generally, you are protected, and, and fortunately, your employees are protected, too. So Scott's going to take on the next couple of slides. Thanks, Hayes. Um, so we did want to briefly discuss the WARN Act. It, it's uh, not an act that, that many people are aware of, but essentially, uh, in good times, it, it applies that if you're having a, or not good times, you, it's usually applied in situations not like you're seeing now, but it, it probably does um, still have some applicability um, that it applies to closures and layoffs, mass closures and layoffs. And it, it, it does apply if you have over 100 employees, um, you have to, and you're doing layoffs. And you're laying off uh, potentially more than 50, 50 or more employees or closing certain facilities, you are under this, under the WARN Act, which is a federal act, you are required to give a 60 day notification. Now, there is an unforeseen circumstance um, exception to this act. It's unclear or we haven't received any guidance if COVID 19 emergency will, will fit into that or be deemed to be an unforeseen circumstance. Um, but as of right now, uh, it hasn't been specifically defined as such. So we just want to flag that for some of the larger employers um, that there is potential WARN Act issues that, that need to be considered when you're um, laying off a large group of individuals. Um, on the next slide, 29, um, again, how to handle health insurance premiums during a furlough or closing. This is a, 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 a difficult issue, um, but you need to, A, um, speak with your broker because you need to make sure that you are keeping employees or you want to keep the employees under your health insurance plan if that's been available to you if you're furloughed or, or cease operations because your plan may not allow that. Um, you may be able to also consider informing your employees that you're going to pay that premium with the expectation that when things get back to normal, you're going to deduct it from their salary. However, if you're going to go that route, um, you would need to get a written authorization from them before you do so to explain that you're advancing this money subject to uh, reduction of future wages. Because as you may know, you cannot take deductions from an employee's 
paycheck without their written authorization. So it, it, there are some different options. And also I would point out in the CARES Act, um, which has not been passed yet, that this may be another category for loan forgiveness if, if you're paying health insurance premiums. So that, that needs to be worked out. Hayes, I'll turn it back to you for slide 30. Thank you. And just a good reminder that anytime you're going to deduct from any employee's paycheck, you need a written authorization. Um, that, that, that comes up more than you'd think. So I'm going to try to get through these last slides quickly so we can get to the question and answer session or answer some of your questions. An employer cannot restrict an employee's personal travel to high-risk areas. Um, the problem here really is that you end up looking at the country they're going to and that the restriction ends up being one that looks quite discriminatory. It looks like a national origin situation, um, especially if they're going to visit family, which frankly would be one of the few reasons anybody's traveling during this time. So. We really caution people against restricting the travel. Now, what you can do and what you should do, and what OCHA probably requires you to do, is require that these people um, quarantine and don't come back into the office when they get back, because now it's a matter of protecting your other employee. So, next slide, please. Can an employer refuse to work because they are concerned about infection? And OSHA says that you can only refuse to work. If there's an imminent danger of death or serious physical harm, and imminent means something that is very likely going to happen. And it doesn't seem that this pandemic has created that. Um, hopefully, it, it does not create that at any point. So, an employer can let the worker use unpaid leave or paid leave if possible, um, but it simply cannot, cannot stay home without some sort of leave being available. So, the last question we have here is, if anybody has comments for the Department of Labor, um, having read the statute or our explanation of the statute, or if you're just curious what other companies might be confused about or uh, what questions or comments they might have on the legislation, the Department of Labor has created an idea scale website where people can chime in and Department of Labor says it will review those submissions, ideas and questions um, by March 29th, and that deadline also suggests that at that point the Department of Labor will be closer to issuing its regulations as to what the legislation actually means and how it will be enforced. That concludes our slideshow portion of the presentation, but we do want to get to some of the questions that have been submitted to us. Sure. So Hayes, I'm going to I'm going to start tackling a few of these and we and we have a lot of them and we're going to do our best to get through uh in the next uh you know, 5 or 10 minutes and and we'll we'll probably go a little bit over due to the technical issues. Um so we understand if you need to leave it at 10, but if, I mean 11, but if you can stay, that would also be great. So we have a question um and it's is if you're able to telecommute and you're able to work, can the employee claim eligibility under the new federal act? So if the employee is able to telework and they don't fit into any of the other categories eligible for the leave, then they would not be able to get that benefit. I believe what your question is is, is asking at is if we I've seen this as a follow-up question, is that um, if the individual has child care issues and uh, but you want them to telework and they want to take the leave because there's no one to watch their children. Again, and there's no guidance on this, but I would probably suspect that that is, if, if teleworking is not um, appropriate given their needs to take care of their, their children, they probably are free to elect to use the coverage under the act and not, and not telework. Again, we, we need to get some guidance on that. But that would be from reading the reading the statute and the way that the law is and the way that other leave benefits work. Um, that that would be our 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 best bet um, that they would that they would have to um, they wouldn't have to work remotely. Um, another question is Scott. Um, I just want to jump in and note that um, I stated a couple times that the FFCRA will take effect on April 2nd. And 
it actually is April 1st. Um, that, that's come down recently. So, sorry to interrupt, Scott. You can carry on. Okay. Thanks for that. As, as, as you can imagine, um, things are happening very, very rapidly, and we're, we're doing our best to stay on top of everything. Um, we also have questions regarding um, if, if, they, if you need a doctor's note uh, to support um, any of this leave that, that's coming down under the new federal, federal law. Um, so typically, in, under the FMLA, you would need some sort of certification. Uh, and again, the certification requirements are somewhat being relaxed given the current circumstances. They do not want doctors to have to be overloaded in, in writing notes to employers if, if, and so they can focus their attention on the sick patients. So the guidance is that if, if someone is eligible, um, the DOL, or I'm sorry, the, the act sort of uh, indicates that they would like, the, per the person should be paid um, this benefit subject to certification. And I think we'll see this in the guidance, but you'll probably have to pay them a certain amount of time and tell them to then uh, follow up with, with a doctor's note. And, and my other guess is that they're going to be less stringent on the formal requirements. It's probably going to be something that, you know, the doctor could email out to you or, or something that's HIPAA compliant. But I don't think they're going to be asking for the detailed information that usually employers would receive when evaluating a family medical leave request, just because they, I don't, they don't want to overburden the physicians with having to, um, to uh to do that um so yeah, we're getting a lot of questions on the doctor's notes um we're getting some questions regarding um uh, we had some questions about health care essential health care workers and that exemption and uh unfortunately like we said a few times there's no guidance on that right now but I would assume that definitely people providing emergency care or in hospitals or providing, um, you know, uh, care in a in a medical practice, th they would probably they would probably they would be exempt under the act. Um, it, it, it gets a little bit blurrier in a situation when you know they're doing probably when they're doing they're doing preventative. I'm sorry, if they're doing uh, elective procedures, then those healthcare workers probably. Uh, are covered by the act, but it was really meant to exclude healthcare workers and, and first responders. Hayes, you want to jump in on a few? Sure, thanks. I saw uh, one question here, if an employer furloughs 120 of their 150 employees before April 1, can they apply for exemption for being below 50? And I believe the answer there would be no. Um, I think there is a look back period and I also think that a furlough here might not qualify those folks as no longer being employed. I think they're still employees. They're just not being assigned work. Do you agree with that, Scott? Yeah, I think that, that that's correct. Um, we're also getting a question regarding the difference between a furlough and a layoff. Um, I think some of these terms are probably just semantics, but they are probably important uh, for the extent that uh, your benefit plan may use certain terms. So I think you need to check with your benefit provider. And I also think when we get the guidance from the Department of Labor, it may be important if we're using the term uh, furlough or layoff. Certainly, uh, a furlough is a little is different than a termination. A termination is, is that you're ceasing all employment. A furlough is that it's temporary. However, um, under those circumstances, you, you do need to see how that's going to handle how that's going to affect your health care benefits or the person's health care benefits. And if health care benefits are discontinued, um, you have to make sure your benefit provider is sending out the appropriate COBRA notices. Um, so the employee can elect to, to, to pick up COBRA if they want to. Uh, we also have a question regarding, can we hire, sorry, documentation. Yeah, we have questions regarding, we have PTO, do we have to also offer the 80 hours? and the answer is, is yes. I mean, the 80 hours, it's pretty clear in the act. It's in addition to whatever else um, you, you offer. So you're going to have to 
provide, and in addition to any other sick and safely benefits that your state or county may may require you to do. Um, it's sort of a fresh thing, and it and it's 80 hours. Uh, again, it, it is subject to um, different payments of, of two thirds versus um, full payment, depending upon what the reason is. So, but yes, you you would not be able to say, well, we already um, give you enough PTO, so you're, you're fine. This is an additional benefit. We also have a question about updating existing handbook. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that right now is the best time to be updating an existing handbook. I think if you have a handbook and a policy uh, needs to be revised or amended, given given the current circumstances, I think you could do a memo um, and make sure that you have a way of tracking that every employee received the memo. I think that that would be that would be fine. I'm not sure doing a wholesale revision of your employee handbook is is prudent right now. Um, probably as things start ramping back up in three three to six months. Yes, I do think that employee handbooks are probably going to need um, to be revised. Uh, but I don't think you can go back and make a change. I don't think making a change right now is going to be is going to be that helpful. You certainly can't go back and say uh, we're taking away your, your PTO hours. That, that would not be allowable. Um, if you want to do that, that you don't accrue any more in the future, you may be able to do that after the emergency ends. But um, I, I don't, you, can't go, you can't go back in time, and I don't think this is the time, to be honest, to make um, major changes in, in, in your policies unless the circumstances require you to do so. I'll jump on a couple here, Scott. Um, there's one question about having gifted a week of pay before April 1st, and then whether they're still obligated to pay the 80 hours after April 1st. And that brings up an interesting point because once April 1st comes around, this new leave is going to be available. So I think the answer there is yes. If you've already given them certain benefits um, under a policy, an employer policy, that, that doesn't take away their ability to enjoy the um, federally provided benefits as of April 1st. And that's another reason why it's important to keep that date in mind as far as um, what the effects of what you've already done might be. Because if it was after April 1st, then you might be able to make them stack the PTO or other leave on top of the federally required leave. But if it's already been given, then they're going to get both, it looks like. And the very next question is for the two-third pay cap. Um, yes, an employee can use PTO to supplement that in order to make their pay whole. So that that is an option that your employees have. And there is another question, and this is something that uh, maybe we, we breezed over, but uh, my understanding is that the D.C. benefits that we talked about apply to people who live in D.C., um, but Scott, do, do you agree with that? And do you think that's generally the the rule rule of thumb for all of these different regimes that we've discussed? Um, well, I think it's if, if it's also if they work in those jurisdictions. Is that okay? So it, it it's more keyed on the location of the employer. Um. Uh, the only exception would be on the unemployment. The unemployment may look to where they work or where they live, but the other, but all the other leave benefits, I think, are tied to where where they work. Um, of course, if they always have been a teleworker, um, that could be their home. I, I don't think it will be their home now. I think it's going to be where they, for the leave benefits, it's going to be where they have been performing the services. Okay. Okay, Hayes, do you want to do one or two more questions before before we wrap up? Sure. Um, here, here's a here's a good question. Do we need to provide six feet between employees' work areas? And you know that that kind of gets back into the, the OCHA territory, where um, that is maybe a reasonable accommodation that allows people to feel comfortable in the office and um, lets you feel that they're protected. So if if providing six feet is completely impractical, then I don't think you need to. But if it's at all practical, then then we'd recommend doing that. Um, 
if the only possible way for those people to do their work is in close quarters in the office, um, then you've got you and they have a tough decision to make. But if it's at all possible to provide six feet or provide you know any sort of sanitation products they might want in order to feel protected, um, we we encourage that. So I hope we've answered a lot of the questions today. We've tried to look at um, which topics have been addressed by multiple questions. Uh, we hope our slides were informative and maybe anticipated some of your questions. But you see here our contact information. Um, we'll be responding both to emails and although we're not going to be at our office, we will get any voicemails that you leave on our office lines. So you know we we hope a few of you or many of you can reach out to us in the days or weeks that follow as we try to navigate these changing waters and make sense of the world as it is now. Um, otherwise, it, it's been a pleasure putting this presentation together for everybody, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Yes, and I would just add that if you are not on our uh, mailing list and you would like to be added to the mailing list, you can send Hayes or myself an email and we'll add you to our mailing list because we are providing updates and blogs as, as things come out as well as you would be informed of additional webinars. And you can always like us on uh, Facebook. You can like Pally Rothman. Uh, I mean, you can also like us individually, but you can like Pally Rothman on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And you're there. We would also be posting all of our links to all of our blogs and all of our upcoming webinar and events. And there's a couple questions about downloading the presentation. Um, I believe it's available under the handouts tab of your GoToWebinar um, platform. But if you need a copy of it and you can't get it any other way, just feel free to shoot one or both of us an email and we can send that to you. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Have a good day.